In Alaska, the Coast Guard is touching lives in more ways than one. Pressure load, take a load. When a young man with a life-threatening illness wishes to visit his heroes, Air Station Kodiak pulls out all the stops. And salute. It's just amazing. Like, man, this is really where I want to be. While out near Cold Bay, the crew responds to a deadly chemical leak aboard a vessel. You know, that could affect your sight. That could blind you. That can even kill you. And looks can be deceiving when a man is crushed by a backhoe in a remote village. I don't know if he's got one broken rib, if he's got 10 broken ribs. The guy was in a lot of pain. There's life, man. I got them in sight. The vast Alaskan wilderness, a place where beauty is cloaked by danger. Here every day, the highly trained men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their lives to save others. America's deadliest waters are protected by Coast Guard Alaska. Hey guys, uh, got a call from uh, Nanwalik, just south of Homer. There's a gentleman, a 53-year-old male, symptoms of a, a crushed chest. He is on morphine right now for pain management. Uh, we're gonna transport him from Nanwalik up to Homer to meet LifeMed, which is the civilian life flight. Uh, they're unable to get into Nanwalik, which is why we've been tasked to go up there. Let's go. I'm Lieutenant Commander Vincent Jansen, and I'm an A-60 pilot here at Air Station Kodiak. You never know what's, what you're gonna get when that pager goes off. When you hear that noise to think, okay, what's my day about to turn into? You know, luckily we're well trained. You've got the experience, you've got the equipment uh, to adapt to whatever that pager is going to throw at you. And Rotor. Perfect taxi. Brief taxi. Hi, this is uh, Lieutenant Kirk with the Coast Guard. I'll be there at uh, 7 o'clock local time. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. I got a call about a 53-year-old male. He had reportedly been uh, partially crushed by a tractor up there. And uh, so he's in obviously a, quite a bit of pain. This is a fairly short range mission for us. We got rain showers moving in and out, reducing visibility. The H60 crew shouldn't have any trouble getting in. And most of these uh, village clinics are you know, at best a physician's assistant, but they have been able to administer pain medicine to him, and uh, he'll be obviously in much better care once we get him out uh, to Homer, and he can get uh, probably up to Anchorage. A little bit of a pump coming over the mountains as we go through here. In this case, the weather is bad enough that a civilian service is unable to make it into Nanwalik. We have limits that allow us to operate in harsher conditions, and in this case, it's necessary, and that's why they called us. Zero six D seventeen wanted you to know that the Life Med Hilo is going to be at the Homer Airport in three zero Mike. Over. In the Coast Guard, we're always planning for step five, and we're on step one, but we have everything covered in between. So we're trying to cover our boxes and. That's just part of it, planning ahead. I don't want to put him on a back forward if he's not breathing right. But if he's sitting up, I see he keeps sitting up. Yeah. So if there's anything you think you need to do to the cabin, you got a couple minutes to do it. Well, obviously, with any medevac, we're worried about you know what, what the condition of the patient is and what we can do with them. Um, with this individual, we were told he was more comfortable sitting up. So I'm mainly thinking about how I need to get my cabin configured to accept the litter and the patient. Right down the middle looks foggy. Left looks good, right looks good. One approach is restricted by abrupt mountain face. That's why life flight can't get in there with one weather's below 5,000 feet. And those guys are gonna make you a little bump here in the next minute or two. Roger that. Ready for approach. Yeah, doors coming up. The approach into the airport is fairly uneventful. First thing that we do once we have the wheels on deck is make sure everybody's safe, make sure the aircraft is okay, and now we're transitioning to, you know, where's the patient and what are we gonna have to do to get the patient out of there as soon as possible. Apparently, the patient's being held up at uh, the local clinic. So Claude gets a ride uh, in a pickup truck. We're just basically sitting in the helicopter waiting to see what's happening. We've got Claude on the radio, and we're just standing by for an update. So you got some morphine on board? No morphine? Yeah, no yeah, pain turn at all? Took some earlier. Took some earlier? How much did you give him earlier? Uh, no pain. Oh, you got it all? Hey, hello. Okay. You guys hurt. But the guy is is not laid out like your typical trauma patient. So I said to the guy, hey, bud, how you doing? Hurting bad, ribs hurt, 
whole family's there. Okay, we're gonna get you a higher level of care the best we can. Yeah, he said it, he was crushed to like about a minute. I'm not gonna put him in the C spine because it'll take me forever and he can't breathe. So if I lay him down, he, I could risk yeah. him to uh, get some food in his lungs, then I can't manage in a helicopter. So. Yeah. I get a call from Claude over the radio. He's coming down the hill. He's got the patient in the truck in the vicinity of the helicopter. So we walk him up, we take him frequent breaks to kind of let him just catch his breath. The guy was in a lot of pain. He'd been crushed by a backhoe. I don't know if he's got one broken rib, if he's got 10 broken ribs, but he was pretty much a champion. Maybe 50 yards at a time, and he would stop and catch his breath. And that's what I want. I don't want to put this guy in more pain, and I want to get him to care. But he's tough. Then he's got to get in a helicopter, and once he gets in a helicopter, then he's going to have me doing all sorts of stuff to him that's not going to feel comfortable. This guy's going to want to sit so you have a good spot for him. We'll make a spot. The first impression that you get is this gentleman, is he's been in a bad accident, and he's in a lot of pain. He's actually doing a lot worse than I thought he was going to be doing, and uh, he definitely needs our services. Here's all set. Ready, sir. We loaded him into the aircraft and chose not to strap him in due to his injury. Um, we didn't want to risk having him lean back because the most comfortable place for him and where he was able to breathe the best was leaning forward. So we sat him down in my seat and left him there for the flight. You guys are about uh, 15 minutes out. You well enough, Gus? As a paramedic, you start your ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. If you got all them covered, you're going to be OK. Let's try to make this guy's life as pleasant as possible for the 15 minutes he's going to be with us. A little bit of O2 flowing for the patient. He's sat pretty good, just a little precautionary. The flight from Nenwalek to Homer is just a quick one. It's about eight to 10 minutes, favorable winds, right across Kachemak Bay. And there's a big airport in Homer, and they know we're coming. Okay, Homer's mid site. Prepare for fresh. Ready for fresh. There's life, Matt. I got them in sight. The first person to approach the helicopter is the Life Flight's emergency medical personnel. Uh, she comes onto the rotor arc, uh, takes a look at our patient, which is great because he's right there in the flight mechanic seat. This is us. This is him for about one or two minutes, about, uh, probably about 1,400. And uh, lost consciousness, went to the hospital, went to the ER, well, whatever they had there. In this case, the Coast Guard was the only option for this gentleman to essentially get pain relief uh, from his awful accident. And I'm just really glad to be a part of it, glad to have been able to help uh, get him to hire medical care. That's good. Their uh, litter is a uh, raised uh, backboard. Too. Oh, nice. We are doing rescue. We are taking a patient from an extreme situation and getting him to somewhere that we can make him safe. That's what the Coast Guard provides people. I mean, the guy got crushed and he was tougher than I was. Next time I'm in pain, maybe I'll think of him. All right, they're pretty clear. Good job, guys. We in the police, sir. All right, we in the police. I'm Gus Jakadish, Sr. I'm from Nunwell, Alaska. I've lived there for 54 years. I was trying to get a bobcat ready with the backhoe attachment. After I got all the attachments hooked up, I guess I stepped on the lift lever for the backhoe attachment, and the backhoe attachment crushed me against the back of the cab. And after that, I don't, I don't remember. I blacked out. Coast Guard helicopter came in. You know, I just, I'm just glad that Somebody was there to get me out of the village into a hospital. I had uh, four fractured ribs on the right side, three on the left, and a badly bruised lung on the right side and a small laceration to the liver. The Coast Guard guys, I'm, you know, my hat's off to them, and I was really glad they were there. The Make-A-Wish Foundation contacted the Coast Guard about making a dream come true for Braden Hahn. Yeah! I have aplastic anemia, which is a life-threatening illness. They don't have hills like this in Jersey, do they? It's a very long way from home, except I feel right at home at the Coast Guard base. Catcher processor Alaska jurist. They had a refrigerator leak, ammonia poisoning. Ammonia in, in high volume can be serious depending on how long the exposure was and how much was um, inhaled. You know, that can affect your sight, that can blind you, that can even kill you depending on their exposure level.
Braden Hahn, and I am from Sussex County, New Jersey. I am on my Make-A-Wish trip because I have aplastic anemia, which is a life-threatening illness, and the Make-A-Wish Foundation told me that I could have a wish, and so I'm here. This is kind of tells the whole story of where you're at right now and what we do. We own all the search and rescue, basically about this line where the Canadian border is, all the way to the west, over 1,100, 1,200 miles. That's how big we are. Commander Mark Fisley, operations officer at Air Station Kodiak. When we got notified that Braden wanted to be a Coast Guard pilot, we wanted to open the doors and welcome Braden in with open arms and his family and make sure that uh, it was special for Braden. It's a two-day event. We started with an overview of the operations that we do in Kodiak. And then he's going to go to the pool and work with the rescue swimmers. <laughs> Just get a good feel for what they do, get some pool work in, have some fun. We want them to experience those things that these extraordinary enlisted folks do for us. One, two, three. All right. Not a problem. Jump. After that, uh, what we'd like to do is have a tour for each airframe set up, and Braden will experience uh, firsthand with an individual pilot and learn what the pilots go through when they fly. So we have the two pilots flight engineer, and then uh, the one seat we stood on going up top, that's, the, that's where the radio operator sits. So this is the mighty MH-60. This thing can go 300 miles offshore, hover for half an hour, hoist, rescue, do whatever, and then make it 300 miles back. This is the MH-65 Dolphin helicopter. This is what you're going to be flying in tomorrow. This one you can look at more of like a sports car, small, fast. It's more of a short-range recovery helicopter. Getting to meet and work with my heroes up here in Air Station Kodiak feels amazing and awesome. It's a very long way from home, except I feel right at home at the Coast Guard base. Catcher processor Alaska Juris is that yellow dot right there, 90 miles north of Colbert. They had a refrigerator leak, ammonia, poisoning, throwing up, one's on oxygen. Flight surgeons recommending medevac. HSs have been notified and they're planning to go with these guys. My name is Lieutenant Randall Black and I'm a C-130 pilot at Coast Guard Air Station Kodiak. Once I got into work, they told me that uh, there was some kind of ammonia leak on a uh, vessel out in the Bering Sea and that three people were incapacitated due to the uh, ammonia. A 65 was in the area on one of our cutters, and they were the best asset to execute the rescue. Then you had us as well. We will be taking the uh, patients back to Anchorage for further medical care. We also want to check and make sure we got Corman going with us so that they can receive medical care while we're in flight. So I have a question for you guys. What are the long-term effects of? The biggest thing is the respiratory condition, which okay, last I heard they were on oxygen. Have you heard anything different? Oh, I heard that, yeah. I'm HS1 Amanda Breeden, being a recently qualified independent duty corpsman. I'm not qualified to fly on the helicopter, so I jumped at the opportunity to fly on the C-130. Ammonia in, in high volume can be serious. I mean, if it's handled wrong, can lead into a fatal situation. The airway may close depending on how long the exposure was and how much was um, inhaled. And then also you have to take into consideration skin contact, eye contact. Long-term exposure without irrigation can also lead to blindness, so we had to be aware of that as well. That could affect your sight, that can blind you, that can even kill you depending on their exposure level. Man, we gotta hurry up and get there. Wind 270 18, visibility one and three quarter miles, light snow, Mid overcast 2100, jump one. Look at that cloud formation. Yeah. Holy crap. Crazy. It's right where the mountain is too, is it? Yeah. That's a really bad weather, you would not find that. We have two approaches. You know, one goes right into the wind, which is better for us flight characteristics-wise, but the ceilings were too low that we couldn't shoot that approach. That's an early business right there. It's obviously the, the chance to save a life. We're going to take a little bit more of a risk. You now, as you get used to the weather conditions up here, you become a little bit more uh, attuned to the weather. Not that you don't respect it, but uh, you get a little bit more used to it. It is going to be kind of a bumpy ride right in. All right, just make sure uh, everybody's seated back there, seatbelt off. Roger. We actually had 30 mile an hour winds on our tail, which created a little bit more of a challenge with icy runways and, uh, and snow conditions. 
the one mile visibility, the blowing snow, the overcast, and all this is coupled with the 30 knot tailwind. So we're coming in faster, which is gonna eat up more runway, and then you throw on the ice on that. It takes a little bit more time to stop the aircraft. Once we arrived to Cold Bay, we determined who was most critical and who needed the most care. So we dived right in, assisted with IVs, and did a quick assessment on all three of the patients. One was complaining of respiratory distress, the other one was complaining of chest pain, and then the other one, our biggest concern with him was his blood pressure at the time. From there, we just treated as needed, getting oxygen on them. Irrigation was another one. One patient had pretty severe eye trauma, which can lead to blindness. Clouds. Uh, we got a good tailwind, so it took us about an hour and 15 minutes to get to uh, Anchorage. There was some kind of ammonia leak on a uh, vessel out in the Bering Sea. Once we got there, we unloaded three patients. Our crew are on our way. We've already coordinated uh, with the uh, ambulance in Anchorage, so as soon as we land, they should be there waiting for us. We can get uh, the gentlemen off the plane as soon as possible. The patients were stable, still in fairly critical condition. I know one patient was coughing up fluids due to the ammonia ingestion. Another one had to continually have his eyes washed out. One of the patients had pretty acute exposure to the face, so our first level of treatment was irrigating his eyes and decreased the chances of any long-term damage to the eye. The patient with acute respiratory distress, we sat up position of comfort treated with oxygen. The other one was comfortable laying down, and so we allowed him to lay down and just continued to monitor his vitals. En route to Anchorage is about another hour and a half, two hour flight. They stayed pretty stable the whole way, which is our goal, to keep them stable or have them improved when we transport to the ambulance. I mean, how often do we do this? With these three guys, I'm gonna have 14 live saves this year. The year before that, I had one. It was a great feeling to help them out. You know, mostly it's the helicopters who are getting, you know, face-to-face -face time with patients. Normally, we're the ones high up above the helicopters circling them, making sure they're all right. But this time, we were called on. A sense of satisfaction and gratitude that we were able to get it done and, and to help people. Uh, that was pretty smooth. So as soon as we land, there's already an ambulance there waiting for us so that basically once we shut down the engines, they're ready to get the patients off and get them over to the hospital. I definitely have pride for the aviation mission specialists that go out and do that every single day. Personally, it feels great coming home knowing that I made a difference. I'd take any opportunity that came my way to fly on the C-130s again. I absolutely would do it again. The Make-A-Wish Foundation contacted the Coast Guard about making a dream come true for Braden Hahn. Braden was suffering from an illness, and it was his desire and his dream to be part of the Coast Guard. Okay. You gonna get us away from the pier? We wanted to allow him some exciting, rewarding opportunities with our crews. I'll try not to be backseat. Whenever you're ready, just tell him to take the lines off. Take the lines off. My name is Becky Hahn. I am from Freedon, New Jersey. Braden got to drive the boat. That was a little crazy. We were not expecting that. Going a little faster. Going a little faster. Yeah. Go ahead. Perfect. Now turn us over to the left. We won't flip, I promise. Okay. <laughs> we're just going to keep going straight back in here, and then we'll meet up with the helix. Yeah, one, zero, one, six, zero, five. Our entire course, as we discussed before, we're going to start out with a trail line delivery of the rescue over. Zero, five, zero, one, Roger, uh, zero. I'm going to take over from here. You jump back there and watch that we'll get into the, the rescue yeah. summer. Getting to drive the boat through the bay and having a helicopter uh, be hovering over us was pretty cool. I'm AST2, Scott Muscatel. I'm a rescue swimmer here at Air Station Kodiak. I think it was really neat that Braden showed an interest in the Coast Guard and coming to find out what we do. 
I deployed out of the helicopter, swam up to the boat, got up on the boat and just talked to Braden a little bit, showed him what we would do uh, in a real scenario. Braden's a kid in a pretty tough situation, and to see him smile and to see the gratification on his face makes my job worthwhile. I think Braden had an incredible time. Seems like they keep one upping the last thing that they did, and everything that he did just got better and better. When we get on scene and there's someone who has a heart attack, my heart rate goes up a little bit because things can go wrong and there's only so much you can do. All right, sir, we're ready to go in the back. Normally with a heart attack, you want to have the heart rate in the 60s. He was running in the 80s. My name is Rob Simpson. I'm an aviation survival technician, second class here at Coast Guard Air Station Sitka. The night before, we'd had a medevac out of Skagway, and we were fully intending to fly home and end our duty day, um, but we ended up diverted onto another case, a cruise ship passenger who had reported heart attack symptoms. Roger, we are altering our course to head to Huna. Lieutenant Damon Thornton, pilot at Air Station Sitka. The cruise ship is in harbor there at uh, Huna, and instead of us hoisting off of the cruise ship, they're going to take the patient and put him on an ambulance and take him to the Huna airport, where we will meet him. Oh, wow. The uh, airspeed just shot up. I think it was a pretty big gust of wind. As soon as we left Juno, the weather started closing down on us, and it stayed that way. We were in and out of low visibility. How's the visibility of the front, sir? Still see the water. OK. All right, I got the land off the right side. You're well clear, clear right. I'm Captain Thomas White, flight surgeon for Air Station Sitka. I am never totally at ease with a heart attack because you can have sudden complications. Two four, ready for approach. Ready for approach. All right, got the uh, runway in sight. When we get on scene and there's someone who has a heart attack, my heart rate goes up a little bit because Things can go wrong, and there's only so much you can do as an EMT. But having a doctor on board with his capabilities changes everything. We want to make sure that he's in a position of comfort. We don't want to increase his anxiety. We don't want to cause him any pain, which can worsen a heart attack. All right, see if I can pick up some weather. Uh, the patient's wife was in the back of the ambulance. We absolutely made the call to take her with especially with someone who's having a heart attack. Um, if, if you put yourself in that situation, you would want your loved one with you in the back of a noisy helicopter. All right, sir. We're ready to go in the back. OK, sounds good. You OK, sir? His heart rate was a little bit higher than I would have liked it. Normally, with a heart attack, you want to have the heart rate in the 60s. He was running in the 80s. Sector Juno, Sitka Rescue 6038. We have departed Huna with the patient, and we are en route Juno at this time. I thought it would be a good idea to administer a medication to slow his heart rate down. We want to make sure that his heart is as relaxed as it can be. Be in Juno about 20 minutes. Roger that, sir. I am very much encouraged that the patient is conversant. His blood pressure is fine. He appears, by all appearances, to be stable. Good work, ready for approach. Ready for approach. When we come on duty, we certainly don't hope for anything bad to happen to anyone. Um, but we do do this job because we love it. So, so to have a day like this, where we were able to help people that needed help, um, that's professionally rewarding, for sure. We send the patient off on the medevac flight. I have to step back just a little bit at that point and decompress from a very, very busy prior 24 hours. Thank you, Thank you. To be able to apply 
my own background, my own knowledge in an exciting job that helps other people, I have the best job in the world. My name is Lowell Humberg, and I'm from uh, Merritt Island, Florida. When the doctor told me that I was having a heart attack, first thing I was thinking about was if I was going to possibly die. Away from home, away from my kids, we were so looking forward to this trip because I've always wanted to come to Alaska. It was a funny, a funny talk by my wife, but let's do it. When I saw the Coast Guard, I knew I was in safe hands because they're always there. If they're needed, they'll go out of their way for people. I, I had no worry after that. I want to thank the Coast Guard for what they did out there. I, I'll, I'll remember you the rest of my life. Thank you. What we'll do is we'll take off. We're going to fly through the Buskin Pass, come down into Anton Larson. We'll go offshore to show you what it's like to be in the offshore environment and then back on into home plate. Lieutenant Michael Ross, I'm the H-65 standardization officer. Today we're taking out Braden Hahn. This is part of his wish to be a search and rescue pilot. So uh, I've been fortunate enough to be selected to go out single pilot with uh, Braden. All right, go ahead and hop in. Have an amazing flight. Braden has a rare disease called aplastic anemia and that qualified him to get a make-a-wish trip. Braden's wish is to be a helicopter pilot. And the best way to do that is to get firsthand knowledge of what a pilot goes through and then have a conversation with the pilot as they fly along. Don't have hills like this, New Jersey, do they? Sometimes if you were doing search and rescue and the weather's bad, you'd have to fly this low and lower to get through to your star station. Having that radar, sometimes it's key. See up right there in the water, Braden, off to the left. That's all the people fishing. Oh, here's a buffalo out the right side. See y'all come around right. And now, hold, watch the controls. Go ahead and turn that knob right here, just a couple clicks at a time. Yep, right there. Go ahead and turn it right. Feel it there? How'd you like that, man? So I'll let you steer us, covering the flight controls. Go ahead and steer us left. Being able to actually control the helicopter was just like, man, this is really where I want to be. Like, in however so many years, if I become a pilot, this is what I want to be doing. We'll come around, sit to the right, and we'll go out to that island. There should be some whales out the right door. See if we can spot some whales. Oh, yeah. yeah you look off the point of the island here, you see, like, spray come out of the water. Oh, yeah, you can see them real good right there. Look how big they are. And you see, you get away from the land, and it's a whole lot of nothing out there. Everybody ready for landing? Ready, yeah. 6599 has Yankee, clear to land, approaching 3-6. I really didn't want it to be over at all. It's only been an hour, which would be a long time for anyone else, but for me, it flew by in an instant. How was that flight, Brady? Great. Okay. Something to give you, man. It's 865 Alaska Patrol. We keep these coins on us. So I want you to have this coin, dude. There you go. Thank you. For your first flight in 865. Being able to fly Braden was a highlight of my uh, career with uh, 3,000 plus flight hours. This was uh, right up there with the top one or two single uh, events. I asked him how he liked it at the end. He said it was a highlight of his childhood. And I just wish him all the best. That was awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, right, thank you guys. Cool. Thank you. When they landed and Braden got out of the helicopter, I could tell he was overwhelmed. I'm sure over the next several days and probably years, we'll still be hearing about it and little bits and pieces that he's just kind of saving for himself and savoring. Yeah, I saw the fishing vessel roof him. This individual was having a stroke. He was pretty lucky because we were literally minutes away. That's them right there. Have a door's coming open. Right, Perfect, Perfect. 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 
My name is Lieutenant Nick Hazel. I'm one of the pilots at uh, Air Station Kodiak. It was a nice day. We were out on the trainer. Uh, the weather was beautiful, clear skies. Uh, we heard a distress call. The vessel Ruth M, one of their crew members, was having a stroke. And Ruth M, this is Coast Guard Victor Anchorage. Over. Yeah, Roger. I was the one that called Navy. What stroke symptoms he's experiencing? Over. Tingling in his face. His face went numb. Slurred speech. Left arm tingliness. When did this all begin? Over. Began 10 minutes ago. 10 minutes ago. All right, guys, what do you think? Bill, you're the expert. He's okay. got tingling in his face. You hear that? Is he having any other symptoms? No, sir, now. Lieutenant DJ Wright, pilot at Air Station Kodiak. So if this individual was having a stroke, he was pretty lucky because we were literally minutes away. Oh, we're not looking very far away. Should be 11 miles off the nose. 11 miles, Roger. Name and age of the patient, over. Patient is Jared, age 31. Is there any Roger. history of stroke, heart history, over? You guys already we had a similar, no. not quite this intense but a similar episode a uh, month ago. It went, came and went very fast. That's the right there. Have a door's coming open. We flew direct to the location. There were two vessels there. The one that had his nets out was the vessel that had the individual. We started talking to him, trying to figure out what we we're going to do. Straight and break. Roof in. Coast Guard Hill 6003 on 22. Yeah, OK, Roger. I'll just try to get this net in here. Is the patient ambulatory, Mrs. Pastor? Yes, he is. He's, he's there. He's just laying down. Roger, we'll be standing by, sir, right here. Thank you. When we first got there, we couldn't have hoisted the individual uh, because the boat had all its nets out and there was no clear path to the vessel. That's where the good Sam came in. Yeah, Coast Guard yeah. helicopter has Lady Sandra. Lady Sandra's Coast Guard helicopter. Go ahead. The uh, patient is in my same skiff right now. Ruth Sam is trying to retrieve their net. I think he's on the white boat now. Yep, he's in the back of the boat there, the white yes. boat now. So, do you think we can still get a basket to the same skiff there, Brad? Yeah, I can get it in there, put it on top of the net. Mark, you're still going to stay on board, you're going to sit me down. I think if he can just get the basket, his time is of the essence for stroke symptoms. My name is Brad Steinbach, I'm AMT2, flight mechanic on the H60s here in Kodiak, Alaska. I'm usually a firm believer of getting the swimmer down there first to assess the situation. But the guy was mobile, he was able to get in the basket all by himself. Another hoist would add on a couple more minutes that this guy really needed. Basket's go up to Evan Door. Basket's outside, basket's going down. I don't know where they're going to put it. The crew members on the back of the boat, they were going to receive the trail line on their Sane skiff. But as soon as they saw the trail line lowering, they kind of moved to the back of the boat where all the obstructions were at. Their net on board, their boom, their shackle was all in the way. Have to put it on the, uh, like we intended, the original plan. Go forward, 10. Hold it. Forward, 5. I'm going to hang out right here. OK. Hold. I felt confident enough to continue, so I delivered the trail line to the crew members. They pulled the trail line as I connected the hook to the basket. And I delivered the basket right underneath the boom. And they kind of set the basket off to the side on top of the net, which kind of it wasn't the most stable platform for the guy to get into. I don't see it. This could be, uh, yeah. they put him right underneath that boom, so he's going to come off a little sideways. Roger. So as I got the basket on deck, trying to tell the pilot where to kind of move the helicopter to, because they're dead in the water. They're moving all sorts of directions. The cable's coming down underneath the boom. So I'm just kind of looking around, trying to manage the cable at the same time. He's forward. Right. Five. Hold, pressure load, take it load. This hoist was a little bit more challenging than the usual. The boat was dead in the water, the big net on the back. They didn't move the hoist off to the side for us. So it just kind of created a different hoisting area than usual. Uh, just low cabin door. Bring it back to the cabin. Once we 
hoisted the survivor on board. We're gonna take the survivor to Cordova. He could receive the best level of care. Check range, six two zero three on channel We have the uh, individual off of the vessel and proceed to direct to Cordova this time. Mayday was for a man having a stroke on a saner boat. The guy was mobile. He was able to get in the basket all by himself. All right, Jared, just suck up this boat, too. Breathe deep. Get a nice, good seal right here. Just, it's free. Just use it up. My name is Bill Cron. I'm an aviation survival technician here at Air Station Kodiak, Alaska. We brought the, the survivor up. Uh, he immediately administered oxygen. I checked for the smile test to see if there's any kind of facial drooping or the arms, if there was any kind of instability. Good guy, looking at his left eye. Is he uh, pretty lucid? Yeah, he's pretty lucid. After we got him on board, it was a short flight back to Cordova. We figured that was uh, the best situation for him to get him immediate medical care. Uh, people, are people, uh, pulse, uh, blood pressure is right at 120 over the his symptoms almost right away seemed to be alleviated, and all that seemed to stabilize after oxygen was administered. Are you comfortable? As compared to what you were feeling earlier, would you say you're feeling a lot better now? Is there anything uh, that you were doing on the boat that made uh, what you're feeling intensified? Doors coming open. Doors open. The fact that we were there and in a sufficient amount of time to get him there and hopefully alleviate any uh, you know, permanent damage is really a nice feeling for us as a crew. How's my tail looking? Tail's looking good. Look good on the right side, passing through 35 feet. Roger. Overall, this is a pretty cool case to have out in Cordova. Um, a lot of fishermen out right now that are looking up to us to help them out if in a time of need. OK, Jared, can you walk? All right, take it nice and easy, nice and slow, all right, buddy? Bill's going to head out with them. Comstag Kodiak, uh, right now we're on deck at the uh, medical facility in Cordova, and uh, we'll be taking off here in the next couple of minutes. Good work. My name is Jared Nevola. I live in uh, Sabika, Minnesota. I spent just over five years active duty Army, uh, another two years in the Army National Guard out of Minnesota. Leading up to the day of the incident, we'd been fishing for about two weeks straight. I started getting a little lightheaded, just just weird feeling, you know, just or something just didn't feel right in my head. Meanwhile, I went up and talked to my captain, and he was like, you're having a stroke. Apparently, I passed out on the cabin floor, <laughs> 31 years old, and I'm having a stroke, which is whatever, I guess it's life, but when I heard the coast cutters on the way, to tell you the truth, I felt Relieved, I guess, to tell you the truth. Otherwise, it's a long ride by boat to get anywhere. The air crew that came to rescue me, they were, they were professionals, pure and simple. I mean, they are very good at what they do. Out there in the seas that are 20, 30 foot with people in the water rescuing them. By every fisherman out there, you now you feel like you have somebody watching over you at all times. They got my appreciation 100%. Good afternoon, and welcome to the winging ceremony of Braden Hahn. I knew they were going to be doing a ceremony. I didn't know to what extent. When I saw the men and women standing out there all lined up, everybody in their dress uniforms, it was just really unbelievable. Braden, today is your day. I look over and I see your chest getting a little bit larger, those shoulders being carried a little bit taller. As you look at the wings that we present to you today that you earned, I hope it renews your strength in any task that you seek to accomplish, and I wish you the best of luck in all of your endeavors. Braden Hahn, front and center. I charge you, as you receive your wings of gold today, with the responsibility the Coast Guard aviators have borne for over a century. You must conduct yourself as a professional and with an unwavering commitment to our core values of 
honor, respect, and devotion to duty. As a Coast Guard search and rescue aviator, you must fully ensure that you are prepared to brave whatever storm may come your way. Do you accept the duties and responsibilities of a Coast Guard aviator? Say I do. I do. Say it loud. I do. Very well. Air Station, attention. Let it be known that on the 25th day of July in 2013, Braden Hahn has officially earned his honorary wings as a Coast Guard helicopter rescue pilot. Now Senior Chief McDougal presenting Braden with some wings. I'm aviation machinist technician, Senior Chief Peter McDougal, and I'm the H-60 leading chief at uh, Air Station Kodiak, Alaska. Getting your pilot's wings is the stuff that dreams are made of. In Braden's particular situation where he's got some real serious challenges ahead of him, it's maybe a dream come true or the first step of it. And hopefully one of these days, everything turning out all right, Braden might uh, actually get a chance to join us. Right, you're gonna grow into that one. That <laughs> was awesome. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present Coast Guard's newest aviator, Braden Hahn. And salute. Ready? Two. Looking at this young man, the courage that he shows day in and day out to persevere, if you will, and have a positive attitude was inspiring for all of us. He, to me, represents our core values of what he's dealing with in his life. And I think the ceremony, as well as the entire trip, was probably as rewarding for us an experience as it was for Braden. The moment that they pinned the wings on me will never be forgotten. Nice job, buddy. How's it feel? You feel a little nervous up there? I could have never thought that they all could have been so into this and making my dream come true. Air station, dismissed. I wanted to know that when they left here, it was a great experience for Braden and that he really, truly felt like he was not only a member of Air Station Kodiak for those two specific days, but for the rest of his life.